and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. What is the most important year in history? If you ask 10 people, you'll probably get 10 different answers. Right, medieval Christians, the people who made our modern calendar, more or less, at least refined it, well, they would tell you the year one, right? The year that Christ was supposedly born. If you go back to the people who made the Julian calendar, the precursor to our modern calendar, well, those Roman historians would tell you that the most important year in history was 753 B.C., which was the first year of the Roman ab urnde candida dating system. Ab urbe candida, meaning from the founding of the city, from the founding of Rome, right? Devout Muslims, if you ask them that same question, what is the most important year in history? Well, they would tell you 622 A.D. when... Muhammad fled from Mecca to Medina to escape persecution. This year, too, forms the basis of its own dating system, the Islamic Anno Hegire system. And even now, there are futurists who point to 1969 because of the first moon landing, or 1954 because of the first nuclear bomb. If Elon Musk succeeds in putting people on Mars, no doubt there will be people immediately hailing that day as the most important in history. Now, some of these years are perfectly legitimate. As for the more modern ones, I think it's a bit impertinent for us modern people who don't have crystal balls and can't see the future to assume that something is going on right now is literally the most important thing ever to happen. But it is possible that one of these modern dates, maybe even a year in one of our own lives, is the most important in history, at least to somebody. But if you ask me to name the most important year in history, which is a subjective question... I would say the year 1453. And this will be the first of two episodes covering the siege and conquest of Constantinople by the Ottoman Empire. This conquest would solidify Ottoman control over their European territories, and it would cement their position as a leading world power would also lead to the Renaissance in Europe as leading Greek figures fled their homeland for the West. And the conquest of Constantinople would have wide-ranging effects on global trade, spurring European countries like Portugal and Spain to look for a new route to India and China. If not for the Ottomans, who knows when the old and new worlds might have come into contact. But before we get into the meat of today's episode, I just wanted to make a couple of notes here. First, yes, this is a couple of days late. That's because recording and taking notes on this episode and the next one Basically, they both had to be done at once. There's not really a good way to untangle this material. So you will be getting this episode a couple days late, and then part two uh, next week as usual on Tuesday. The other thing I need to point out is that I made an error last week. Yes, I too sometimes make mistakes. And I said that Murad II pushed the Venetians out of the Crimea. I'm sorry, out of Croatia. Uh, that was not even remotely accurate. I was rattling some stuff off from memory instead of sticking to my notes. And I had my geography off by a few hundred miles. Murad II pushed the Venetians out of some areas in mainland Greece. 
The Venetians, as a matter of fact, would continue to own their Croatian land, called Venetian Dalmatia, all the way up until Napoleon conquered the Republic of Venice in 1797. So that territory also stuck around a little bit longer than the reign of Murad II. Now that I am done apologizing, let's talk about the siege and capture of Constantinople. Last week, we talked about how the Ottoman Turks went from being a small Anatolian beylik, right, basically a dukedom in the Muslim world, uh, they went from that to being the masters of Anatolia and the Balkans. We finished by talking about one of their greatest sultans, Murad II, and while he did not drive the Venetians out of Croatia, he did defeat the Hungarians and Polish in battle not once, but twice. His son, Mehmed II, would take the throne for the second time on February 3rd, 1451. If you'll remember, Mehmed had briefly acted as sultan a few years earlier when Murad retired, but he was too young to rule, and Murad II came back to rule again. Mehmed is still only 19 years old, and he has big shoes to fill. At the time, most Christian rulers think that he will be weak, and you can read letters uh, saying that uh, you know they look forward to having weak Ottomans to beat up on, basically. And many of the Turks agree. They are, some of them, a bit concerned about their great conqueror being followed up by this 19-year-old heir. Well, those Turks did not have much reason to worry, in fact, and those Christian rulers, well, some of them ought to have been a little more concerned, because Mehmed will come to be perhaps the Ottomans' greatest leader. He will be known to later history, to us modern folks, as Mehmed the Conqueror. And he will get his first chance to prove himself almost immediately when the Byzantine emperor Constantine XI attempts to blackmail him. See, at the time, a rival claimant to the Ottoman throne, a man named Orhan, he is living in exile in Byzantium, and the Ottomans, they pay an annual fee to the Byzantines to take care of him and to keep him from coming out into their lands and causing any trouble. Well, when Mehmed takes the throne, Constantine demands that he increase this stipend, or he will be forced to release Orhan. Here is the response of Mehmed's vizier, his chief advisor, a man named Halil Pasha. The official response is, quote, You stupid Greeks, I have known your cunning ways for long enough. The late sultan was a lenient and conscientious friend to you. The present sultan, Mehmed, is not of the same mind. If Constantinople eludes his bold and impetuous grip, it will only be because God continues to overlook your devious and wicked schemes. You are fools to think that you can frighten us with your fantasies when the ink on our recent treaty of peace is barely dry. We are not children without strength or sense. If you think that you can start something, do so. If you want to proclaim Orhan as sultan in Thrace, go ahead. If you want to bring the Hungarians across the Danube, let them come. If you want to recover places that you long lost since, try it. But know this. You will make no headway in any of these things. All that you will do is lose what little you have. Unquote. Now, sources differ on whether this reply is Mehmed's idea 
or whether Halil Pasha is acting on his own. There is still some ambiguity to this day as to who decides to take an aggressive foreign policy towards the Greeks, or as they would think of themselves, towards the Romans. But once this message is sent, Mehmed's course is set, and he commits to it, and he makes it his life's mission to conquer Constantinople, that jewel of cities that his ancestor Osman had seen in his dream. He would set out to fulfill that dream, which was a dream of an empire with Constantinople at its heart. Now, the jewel of cities isn't looking particularly glittery at the moment. It has only been a century since the plague devastated the region, and the city of Constantinople at this time has only about 50,000 residents. By comparison, if you go back to the 9th or the 10th centuries, you see population estimates in the range of about three quarters of a million, up to around 900,000 on the high end. That's probably an overestimate, but still, you know, three quarters of a million people. But any time before the modern era, when you have a city of that size, that is a true metropolis. And now it has about 50,000 residents. By no means a backwater village, but there are many cities in Europe at this time of around that size, many in the Middle East. Constantinople is just another regional center. A regional center with a whole lot of symbolic importance and major monuments and history and so on and so forth. But in terms of its ability to throw a punch, so to speak, it's pretty weak. And this reduced population in the city isn't just because of the Black Plague. Again, that was a hundred years prior. The decline actually began about 150 years before the plague, give or take, uh, back in the year 1204 when the Crusaders on the Fourth Crusade sacked Constantinople and divided up the Eastern Roman Empire, right, as some modern people still call it, or the Byzantine Empire, and right, whatever you want to call it, they divided up that Roman Empire. And while the empire would eventually recover, it was never the same from that point on. You had various territories given away to the Crusaders and later on to large numbers of Turkish people coming into Anatolia and invading there, and the empire just has not been what it once was for a couple of centuries at this point. The sack of Constantinople in 1204 by the Crusaders had also had another effect. As part of dividing up the old empire, Venice had gotten a bunch of territory in Greece where she could access the Black Sea without relying on Byzantium. Right? Venice, all the way to the Crimea at the top of the Black Sea, that's a long trip. Greece to the Crimea, well, that's doable. And the Crimea was a major trading port. As a matter of fact, the Genoans, who are also expanding at this time, well, they have created their own colony in the Crimea at a place called Kaffa. And these trade routes provide access to trade with Asia, trade which had previously been dominated in one form or another by the Byzantines. And it means that the Byzantines don't have all of the insane wealth that they used to. Instead, it's divided up. 
The Genoans have some, the Venetians have some, and since the rebirth of the Byzantine Empire, the three powers have been trade rivals, and they've often picked at each other. And when Mehmed the Conqueror comes to rule the Ottoman Empire, all three are concerned about the rise of the Ottomans. The Venetians a little less so. They have a trade agreement with the Ottomans. The Genoans are more worried. To get to their trading colony in Kaffa, in the Crimea, they have to go through the Bosporus. That is a narrow strait uh, where Constantinople sits on the European side and Anatolia, which is now controlled entirely by the Turks, well, that's on the Asian side. And the Genoans are concerned that if Byzantium, Constantinople, were to fall to the Turks, their trade route to their colony at Kaffa could be threatened. A lot of this trade could be easily shut off by a powerful Ottoman Empire that controls both sides of that strait. And the Genoans are also more potentially useful to the Byzantines as an ally because they have that colony at Kaffa, right? They could send help potentially from Asia or from Europe as needed if the Byzantines were to come under attack. Now, in addition to the strained trade relations between these three powers, there are also strains on the cultural relations, at least between the Byzantines and their Italian counterparts. See, in these very religious times, these are, after all, the years at the tail end of the Middle Ages, In these very religious times, while all three of these powers are nominally Christian, the Byzantine Empire is Eastern Orthodox, and Genoa and Venice follow the Catholic faith. And that puts a little bit of a divide between the three. And this divide was even more significant between Byzantium and another major power, the Pope. The Pope is fairly powerful at this era, maybe not so much militarily. He does have an army. It's not one of the strongest in Europe. But his strength is not primarily military, right? The Pope can, for instance, call a crusade. The Pope can do things short of that to get other Christian nations to help you out if you're, say, under attack from a non-Christian power. So if you are Byzantium, maybe you want to be on the good side of the Pope right now. But the religious divide makes that difficult. And this is not just a little divide. Uh, In 1053... The Pope and the Patriarch of Constantinople had excommunicated each other, right? They had basically kicked each other out of the church in an official capacity. But over the past four centuries, talks between the two churches had been ongoing. And in 1439, there had been a breakthrough at the Council of Florence, At that council, both sides officially came to an agreement on all major points of doctrine. And it seemed as if the two churches were going to be reunited. But the same year, the old patriarch of Constantinople dies, and the new patriarch is a known opponent of the reunification efforts. Now, the Byzantine emperor at the time, right in 1439, uh, John VIII, he badly needs Latin allies. He needs help from somewhere else in Europe because 
Byzantium cannot stand alone, so he badly needs this reunification, and despite the patriarch's opposal, right, this patriarch is the head of the Greek church, despite his opposition, uh, John VIII continues to pursue uh, reunification between the Eastern and Western Church as a matter of official imperial policy. And when he dies in 1448, his younger brother Constantine XI continues that policy. Well, who is this guy, this Constantine the Eleventh? anyway? We've talked about Mehmed, and he's young, he's ambitious, he has big shoes to fill in the form of his father's conquests. Who is this Constantine the Eleventh on the Byzantine side? Well, the last emperor in the East, the last emperor of Constantinople, has one major parallel with the last emperor in the West. See, the last Western emperor was named Romulus Augustulus. He had the same name as Rome's mythical founder, Romulus. So, perhaps it's fitting that Constantine XI shares the same name as Constantine the Great, who founded Constantinople. But... The later Western Roman emperors had been weak puppets. Romulus Augustulus in particular was put in place because he could be counted on not to cause any trouble. Constantine XI is worthy of his namesake. He's a soldier, and he has been his whole life. In the year 1451... When 19-year-old Mehmed takes command of the Ottoman Empire, Constantine is already 46 years old. He's an experienced military leader and administrator. He is the son of Manuel II and a Serbian princess. From a young age, he would be expected to lead troops in battle. He spent much of his youth in Moria. This is a Byzantine province in the southwestern part of Greece, right, in the Peloponnesian Peninsula. This is one of the Byzantine Empire's very few territories outside just a few miles of the city itself. The other one is a place called Trebizond, which is a territory, again, up in the Crimea, right, where that uh, Genoan colony is at the north end of the Black Sea. But that's it. That's all the Byzantine Empire has. And when Manuel II dies, right, when Constantine's father dies in 1425, his older brother John becomes emperor, and so Constantine becomes what is called the despot of the Moria. That is the duke or count, if you will, of the Moria, of what is now much of modern-day Greece. And he co-rules this territory with his brothers Demetrius and Thomas. And under Constantine's leadership the three brothers drive the Italians out of the Peloponnese, right? Some Italian city-states had been building colonies there, and he pushes them out, uh, regains all of that area for Byzantium. So even as the rest of the empire is just having horrible, horrible trouble, Moria actually seems to be doing quite well. And... It does so well that, well, Constantine actually gets a little bit of practice at being the emperor. Twice during his brother John's reign, uh, once actually while John is negotiating with some bishops, uh, Constantine is temporary regent of the empire. And he balances that with building Moria back not just as a cultural center, 
an economic center, but also as a military center. Right? He recognizes that Moria is perhaps more defensible than Byzantium itself. It's a little bit larger area, for one thing. And for another thing, this whole peninsula is connected to the mainland by a very narrow isthmus. And so across this isthmus, Constantine rebuilds an ancient wall called the Hexamillion Wall, and that is a wall that basically walls off this part of Greece from the rest of Europe. Think of something like Hadrian's Wall in the UK, and you won't be far off the mark. And then he goes even further. During the 1444 Crusade, when the Hungarians, among others, are trying to liberate Bulgaria from the Ottomans under the lead of Jan Hunyadi, well, Constantine takes advantage of the opportunity to strike the Ottoman rear. He attacks Athens, which is just a little bit northeast of the Hexamelian Wall and is, at the time, an Ottoman tributary, and he defeats them and he forces them to become Byzantine vassals instead. So he's actually making gains against the Ottomans, but... This was an overreach. As soon as the old Sultan Murad II is done dealing with Jan Hunyadi and the rest of the Crusaders at the Battle of Varna, he turns around and doesn't just take Athens back, but he actually knocks down the Hexamillion Wall, right, destroys it with artillery, and then invades the Peloponnese, uh, Moria, and just devastates the area, burns the crops, kills the livestock, right? He's just punishing Constantine for daring to attack at the Ottomans. And then he forces Constantine personally to pay him tribute, It was just a few years later, in 1448, that Constantine hears that his brother John has died. His brother dies in December of that year, and Constantine is crowned in Moria, actually. He doesn't go to Byzantium right away. He's crowned in Moria in January of 1449. And this is probably a conscious decision. Uh, He doesn't want to be crowned by the patriarch because he is trying to go ahead with this religious unification, right, with the Roman church, continue his brother's policy as we were talking about. But he also doesn't want to be crowned by the Pope or any kind of Catholic bishop for fear of angering his Orthodox population. So he's just crowned locally over in Moria before coming to Constantinople afterwards. And at the time, he is broke. The royal treasury is bankrupt. And so he is forced to raise taxes on imports from Venice. This is according to some historians, what causes Venice to make a trade agreement with the Ottomans in 1451. You can see these events just two years apart, right? Putting taxes on the Venetians and the Venetians trading with the Ottomans instead. Well, it's easy to see why people would draw that connection, and that is probably the case, but... It's also possible that the Venetians may have made an agreement with the Ottomans, at least in part, for personal reasons. See, before becoming emperor, Constantine had been engaged to the daughter of the Venetian Doge. Upon becoming emperor, he had broken off the engagement, a grave personal insult. 
And it's interesting to read about this incident because it highlights some of the cultural differences between the mercantile, relatively democratic Venetians and the very, very old-school and blue-blooded Byzantines. This is what George Schrantzies says. I'm probably horribly butchering that name, by the way. But uh, George Schrantzies is a Byzantine courtier, and he is an aide to Constantine XI. And he says, quote, The doge Francesco Foscari was opposed to dispatching aid not because he was inept. Indeed, our emperor Lord John and others who had met him and talked to him maintained that they had not seen a wiser man in Italy, but because of spite and malice. For spite generally overlooks advantage. The reason for his attitude was the following. Foscari had sent Alvise Diedo as his intermediary to Lord Constantine, who was then the despot of the Moria to propose marriage between his daughter and Lord Constantine, promising a handsome dowry. Lord Constantine agreed to this betrothal, not so much because of the dowry, but because his territories would be joined to those of Venice. I advised him to agree more forcefully than others, and he took my advice. Once Constantine had become emperor and come to the city, this marriage was out of the question. What nobleman or noblewoman would ever receive the daughter of a Venetian, even though he might be the glorious doge, as queen and lady for more than a short time? Who would accept his other sons-in-law as the emperor's fellow sons-in-law, and his sons as the brothers-in-law of the emperor? The doge insisted on the marriage, and after our final rejection, this man became our enemy. Unquote. But there are other powers besides Venice who might be willing to help the Byzantines. Right? Constantine, early in his reign, knowing full well that at some point or another, Mehmed II is going to attack his city, he preemptively reaches out to a number of other powers. He sends dispatches to Hungary, to Naples, and even as far as France. But all of these powers are busy, or like Hungary, they're scared of the Ottomans, right? The Hungarians just got beat twice in the past decade, once at the Battle of Varna in 1444, and again at the Battle of Kosovo in 1448. Maybe even those hardy Hungarians aren't up for round three just quite yet. Constantine personally sends a message to the Pope. But Pope Nicholas V stands firm. He will not help unless the Byzantine Church officially celebrates the Latin Mass, that is the Latin rite of worship as opposed to the Greek rite of worship. Right? They have to c celebrate the Latin Mass, and in the Mass, when they're saying their prayers for individual people, they're supposed to name Pope Nicholas himself. At this time, that is just not politically feasible in the city of Constantinople. Constantine can't do it, so he doesn't. With Mehmed growing ever more aggressive, the small... Byzantine Empire stands alone. Now, in early 1452, the year before the siege, the year before the most important year in history, in early 1452, Mehmed begins the construction of a fortification called the Bogaz Kessin Castle, which literally means straight cutter or throat cutter. The words straight and throat are actually the same thing in medieval Turkish, so it's a pun as well as a name because there is already a sister fortress 
on the Asian side of the Bosporus. And both of these fortresses have big guns. Guns big enough to sink any ship attempting to cross through the strait. With these fortresses, Mehmed can indeed cut the strait, or cut the Byzantine's throat. Now, the land on which this fortress is built, well, this is actually Byzantine land. It's not too far north of the city of Constantinople. It's fairly close to the city walls. And it's a populated area. And and to build this fort, Mehmed has to demolish a village and several churches and a bunch of people protest and they are killed. And... Constantine protests, and Mehmed tells him that he rules nothing outside of Constantinople's walls. He's not the emperor, he's just the mayor of Constantinople. In August of 1452, Mehmed ups the ante. He allows Ottoman herds to graze on nearby Byzantine farmland. When the locals protest, 40 of them are massacred. And this is happening literally within a few miles of the walls of Constantinople. Constantine has no choice at this point. He formally declares war on the Ottomans. Mehmed bides his time. He has Byzantium comfortably surrounded. Instead, he waits for his fortress to be finished, and then he imposes a toll on the strait. Any ship that wants to traverse the Bosporus north to the Black Sea or south from the Black Sea, well, they have to pay a toll to the Ottomans. And during late 1452, Two Venetian galleys call his bluff. In separate incidents, they attempt to run the strait. But in both cases, the results are the same. The large guns on Mehmed's fortresses sink those galleys, and any sailors who survive the sinking, while well, they are beheaded, and at least the captain of one of the ships is impaled and put on display outside the castle to warn other ship captains of what will happen if they don't pay the toll. Either way, the message to the Byzantines is clear enough. You won't be getting any help from the Black Sea, right? either from the Genoans at Kaffa or from your own you know, satellite territory of Trebizond. And Mehmed also blocks off Byzantium from help from the south. He sends a general named Turrican Beg to the Peloponnese to pen in Thomas and Demetrios, right? Constantine's other brothers, those old co-despots of Moria, well, they're still down there in Moria, and they still have an army, but that little isthmus connecting Moria to the rest of Greece, well, that goes both ways. It's easy to defend Moria. It's also easy for Mehmed to park an army outside and just pen those troops in uselessly. The other thing Mehmed does to prepare is he sends engineers to reinforce bridges between his capital at Adrianople and the city of Constantinople. The city of Adrianople is Mehmed's capital at this time, and it's a little ways north of Constantinople, and he's going to be moving a lot of troops and equipment across these bridges soon, and he wants to make sure they can take the weight. But at this point, it does seem as if the clock is starting to tick a little bit for Mehmed, too. 
not in the sense that he's in danger of being hurt or anything like that, but in the sense that the Byzantines are slowly but surely putting together some sort of alliance that might be able to fight back against them. And the linchpin of this effort is Constantine's effort to reunite with the Latin church. In the fall of 1452, Pope Nicholas V sends Nicholas of Kiev, a major bishop, to formally meet with the Patriarch of Constantinople in person. And on December 12, 1452, a Latin Rite Mass is held in the Hagia Sophia, naming both Pope Nicholas V and Patriarch Gregory III. This does meet the Pope's requirements, if only barely, and 300 Byzantine clergy join in the ceremony. Despite this semi-official, semi-reunification, major step towards reunification, despite whatever this is, anti-Latin sentiment is still strong in the city. The memory of the Fourth Crusade is strong. And this remains a contentious issue. There is a famous political phrase that becomes popular in this time period. It's unclear who said it first, but it is... I would rather see a Turkish turban in the midst of the city than the Latin mitre. In other words, I would rather see the city fall to the Ottomans than convert to Catholicism. Better dead than red would perhaps be the American version of that phrase. At any rate... Constantine now has at least a decent chance of getting help from the Pope, and in February of 1453, the year of years, in February, the Venetian Senate also votes to join the Byzantines and to help them fight against the Ottomans. Seems as if Whatever personal beef the Doge has with Constantine, well, he takes that a little less seriously than Mehmed sinking a couple of his galleys and executing a bunch of people. But the Venetians aren't able to send a whole ton of help right away. They need a time to gather some sort of a fleet together in one place, And in the meantime, what they have to offer are the handful of galleys and soldiers who are already in Constantinople. And those Venetian troops will take part in the battle from day one. Now, perhaps the most well-known of all the people to participate in this siege is a man named Giovanni Giustiniani. Giustiniani is a Genoan mercenary leader who is wealthy and successful enough to run his own private island in the Aegean, the island of Chios. And he comes to Constantinople not just with 700 hardened mercenaries, but with a deep expertise in siege defense. He is an expert at holding fortified positions. And so Constantine puts him in charge of the city's land defense. Now, the Theodosian walls have recently been repaired by John VIII. John VIII was not blind to what was happening either, and even before Constantine came to power, Uh, he had already been rebuilding the walls around the city. 
Justiniani would help to keep those walls fully built up throughout the battle. For most of the fight, any time the Ottomans would put a hole somewhere, Justiniani and his men would be there fixing it up almost immediately. And understand that these aren't just any walls. These are perhaps the most impressive fortifications in the world at that time. If you were attacking the city of Constantinople, if you were in the front line of an approaching Ottoman army, the first thing you encountered would be a moat. This moat is about 60 feet across and 30 feet deep. And on the other side, there's actually a four and a half foot wall or breastwork behind it. So on the far bank, there are actually defenders shooting at you over a low wall. And they're standing on a narrow terrace a few yards deep. And that terrace is in front of another wall. This one's a bigger wall. It's 25 feet tall. And it's 6 feet thick. With 40-foot towers spaced every 150 to 250 feet. Kind of irregularly, as needed to defend turns and angles in the wall. And... That wall could be defended with archers. And then behind that wall, there's a raised inner terrace and a third wall, an inner wall, that is 40 feet tall. And that has towers of its own as well. And defenders can move between different walls via postern gates in the towers. Right, so if you're trying to get from the inside of the city out to the breastwork at the moat, you would go into a tower in the inner wall and go down some stairs, and then you would come out a small you know, person-sized door in the side of one of those towers, and then you would you know, run forward to the 25-foot wall, and you could go into a tower and then down some stairs and come out a small postern door, and then you'd be on the terrace uh, by the breastwork there. So you had this deep three-layered defense. Now, if all three layers are fully manned, this is truly formidable, right? You could have crossbowmen at the breastwork and then again on the first wall and then again on the second main wall, right? all firing at once. Now, as it stands, the defenders of Constantinople are not able to use all three walls. They will have to defend the outer wall only and then fall back as needed. And this is because there simply are not enough of them. Including Justiniani's mercenaries, the defenders number between 8,000 to 10,000 men, including around 600 Turkish rebels. That's what Constantine is going to have to work with here at the beginning of his siege. And Constantine is also going to have to defend a different wall. He's going to have to defend his sea wall. The north side of the city of Constantinople sits against a natural harbor called the Golden Horn. And this Golden Horn, this harbor, comes off from the Bosporus and up the side of the city. And this Golden Horn is important, as is indeed all the geography here. So I've actually gone ahead and put a map in the episode description. Well, a link to a map. And it's nothing fancy. It's just the map of the battle on Wikipedia. But that's literally all you need just to 
at least see the geography and say, okay, here's the Golden Horn, here's you know, where the various troops are, here's where the walls are, and so on. It's helpful. And this seawall at the Golden Horn, uh, that is where the crusaders on the Fourth Crusade had ultimately gotten through into the city. And again, this traumatic event in Byzantine history, and Constantine wants to make sure that doesn't happen again. So he takes a massive chain kept afloat with logs and puts it across the entrance to the harbor. And inside of that, inside the Golden Horn, is the Byzantine fleet. And that's going to defend the seawall. And that fleet consists of about 25 ships. This includes five Genoese ships, five Venetian and a handful of other allies. And these are gunpowder-armed galleys at this time. At least in naval warfare, we have moved past the ancient era-type tactics. We are into the time when most navies now are shooting at each other rather than trying to ram each other or board each other. Mehmed the Conqueror also has guns. He has a lot of them on land and sea, and some of them are very large. And this is where money comes into play. See, a year before the siege, a Hungarian iron founder and engineer named Orban had come to Constantinople offering to make them cannons. But... Constantine could neither afford them, nor could he supply raw materials. So Orban went to Mehmed instead. And Mehmed said, Why, yes, please make me some guns. What do you need? Among other creations, Orban builds a 27-foot behemoth called Basilica. It is an important enough cannon to have a name. And Basilica can fire a 600-pound cannonball a full mile. Now, in practice, this particular gun will be as useless as some of the German wonder weapons of World War II. Some of those giant guns. They're too big... The ammunition is too unwieldy, and in the case of Basilica, at some point during the fight, it would actually get knocked off of its gun carriage by the force of its own recoil. But the smaller artillery turns out being very useful in the siege. And there is going to be a whole lot of it. See, the Turks have all kinds of foundries, all kinds of manufactories that Orban can put to use for his purposes. And all of this work is done in Adrianople. That Ottoman capital, not too far to the north of Constantinople. And all of these guns are shipped down Mehmed's renovated road with its reinforced bridges. And the Sultan's first scouts arrive outside Constantinople on April 2nd, 1453. Over the next three days, the rest of his army streams into the area around the city. And on April 5th, Mehmed himself arrives. The total Ottoman force consists of roughly 75,000 troops. Some of the contemporary sources on the Byzantine side will have some absurd estimates in the hundreds of thousands. It was almost certainly 80,000 men or less. Probably around 75,000. Tough to be sure about the exact number, but it includes about 10,000 Janissaries. These tough hardcore heavy infantry the Ottomans were fielding. 
not just the young men from Christians they had taken and enslaved, but the descendants of those young men. This was a warrior caste. This army lines up facing the city on land, and they build defensive positions, and they deploy cannons and artillery throughout those positions. Most of them are deployed right outside the city walls, south of the Golden Horn. The regular troops are in the front with the Janissaries, again these hardest troops, towards the center. And then behind those regular troops, Vemed deploys a second line of reserve trenches filled with irregular troops, militia he had recruited. But the Ottomans cannot access the seawall. Their fleet instead blocks off the Bosporus just north of Constantinople. And again, along with those towers Mehmed had built, that's going to completely shut Constantinople off from the north. And with its position just north of the Golden Horn, this force is also ready to sweep in and cut off any attempted uh, relief of the city. And if another fleet tries to come in to the harbor, they can come down and try and fight it off. Now, the strength of this Ottoman fleet is difficult to judge because contemporary sources, again, give us absurd estimates. We hear people talking about hundreds of ships, but the problem is in part that many of these ships are just basically big rowboats and small transports. They're not really fighting ships. They're just for moving troops around. As far as fighting ships go, uh, the Ottomans have probably between 75 and 100. Now, that's still a lot. That is still three to four times what the Byzantines have floating inside the Golden Horn, and it's a big reason that Constantine ordered that chain to be deployed across the opening. Contemporary Greek historian Michael Critobulus gives us Mehmed's speech to his men on the eve of battle, at least as some eyewitnesses reported it. He says, quote, My friends and men of my empire, you all know very well that our forefathers secured this kingdom that we now hold at the cost of many struggles and very great dangers, and that, having passed it along in succession from their fathers, from father to son, they handed it down to me. For some of the oldest of you were sharers in many of the exploits carried through by them those at least of you who are of mature years. And the younger of you have heard of these deeds from your fathers. They are not such very ancient events, nor of such a sort as to be forgotten through the lapse of time. Still, the eyewitness of those who have seen testifies better than does the hearing of deeds that happened but yesterday or the day before. And he then goes on for several paragraphs listing the earlier Ottoman conquests and the great deeds of former Ottoman leaders. And weaving throughout this story, he talks about how the Romans have always been their enemies. He appeals to their ancestors. And this appeal is also personal for him, perhaps. Remember, Mehmed is young, and his father was a great conqueror, and he wants to live up to his memory. And he says that as long as Constantinople is in Greek hands, the Turks will never be truly safe. And then he concludes, quote, Let us not shame the valor and virtues of our forefathers, nor appear unworthy of them by allowing one city in the midst of our empire, and such an empire to act as a tyrant, and in every way to plot against us. Rather, let us show ourselves to be of their line, sharing in their manliness and valor. For they overran in a short time all of Asia and Europe, and conquered them by their own efforts and perils. They captured many great cities, stormed fortified castles, 
and became masters of countless peoples. And we shall capture this city. Then, sallying forth from it as from an acropolis, with little trouble we shall overrun all the rest in a little while, and nothing shall be able to stand before us, nor shall a single one of the rest be able to resist our power and rule. But in a short time we shall be masters of land and sea. Let us not then delay any longer, but let us attack the city swiftly, with all our powers, and with this conviction, that we shall either capture it with one blow, or shall never withdraw from it, even if we must die, until we become masters of it. Unquote. Mehmed begins the assault with a standard bombardment. His artillery opens up and attempts to blow a bunch of holes in the wall where his men can charge through and take advantage of their superior numbers. But as we already discussed, Giovanni Justiniani and his men do a pretty good job of keeping the walls prepared throughout the fight. As a matter of fact, this bombardment goes on for about two weeks with occasional probing attacks against the walls. Again, to kind of get the idea of how the Constantinople defenders are going to respond to any of this. And throughout these couple of weeks, the Byzantines are awaiting Venetian aid. They know they can't drive off this Turkish force by itself, but their goal is to hold out until they can break the sea blockade then hopefully they can rally other Christians and the Ottomans will be forced to back down. It's a solid plan, but in the meantime, it requires them to, in fact, hold out, and Giovanni Justiniani does masterful work. There is an apocryphal story that Mehmed becomes so enraged that he forces Orban to push his guns beyond their limits. These old-school cannons got very hot when they were fired, and they were not cast using the most modern of techniques, and under extreme heat they could not just crack, but explode. It was fairly common in this era. Now, there is zero historical evidence that Orban, this cannon master whom Ahmed had employed, ended up being killed by one of his own cannons, but he does disappear from history after this battle. So it's possible that he was killed by an exploding cannon. At any rate, following 15 days of bombardment, on April 20th, 1453 a convoy of three Genoese galleys arrives, and this convoy is escorting a Byzantine supply ship. This ship had been out at Sicily, scrounging for supplies, and now it's back. And along with these three Genoese galleys, they're going to try and run the Ottoman blockade. As it so happens, the wind and the current this day make it impossible for the Ottomans to actually close off the Golden Horn. It's like a slow-motion chase throughout the afternoon to see whether the Genoese, along with the supply ship, are going to make it into the Golden Horn or whether the Ottomans are going to beat them to the opening. And... Throughout the course of this chase, both sides are firing at each other, but neither side's fire is terribly effective. Uh, the Ottoman ships have higher decks, and their shots are going clear over the Genoese ships. Meanwhile, the Genoese ships sit low enough down that their shots are going harmlessly into the sides of the Ottoman galleys, neither high enough to hit the crew on the decks, nor low enough to put any holes below the waterline and do any serious damage. So, yeah, a day-long slow-motion chase 
with both sides failing to do any damage to each other, and at the end of it, all three Genoese ships and the Byzantine supply ship all make it into the Golden Horn, and the chain is safely raised behind them. This is a small victory. For one thing, the Genoese ships bring with them 200 papal troops. That's a pretty big deal, at least from a morale perspective. And it does buoy the Crusaders' hopes. And along the same lines, many in the Ottoman camp are angry. How can you possibly fail to block off that harbor? They're trying to get in there with four ships. You had, you know, 75, 100 galleys to stop them with. What are you doing? And a good example of this anger within the Ottoman camp comes to us in the form of a letter. Uh, this is a letter from Sheikh Aksems ad-Din to Sultan Mehmet II. And the Sheikh is urging the Sultan to execute his naval commander, a man named Suleiman Baltoglu. And the letter begins with a quote from the Quran. It says, quote, Thus did it happen to those who were before you. They were stronger than you, and richer in wealth and in sons, and they enjoyed their share. Thus have you enjoyed your share as those before you enjoyed theirs, and you have chattered away as they chattered. Their works were made void in this world and the next. They were the lost. Then the quote from the Quran ends, and the sheikh goes on. Quote, And so those who do not unite with us in battle are not truly Muslims in their hearts. This short verse, in discussing hypocrites, says that all hypocrites shall surely be treated in the same manner as unbelievers in the flames of hell. Unquote. And to be clear, what the sheikh is alleging here is that the naval commander, Suleiman Baltoglu, was a coward. He could have engaged this small number of Italian ships, but he did not. Ultimately, Suleiman Baltoglu would be saved by the pleas of his own men who attested to his bravery. Indeed, he shows up in front of Mehmed with scars from the battle, and Mehmed does show mercy. He only takes all of the man's property and strips him of his rank. He leaves him with his life. And there would be disappointment later on for the Byzantines here as well, although they don't know it at the time. The 200 papal troops on these Genoese ships that got through, well, these will be the only ones the Pope sends. If you remember our episode on the First Crusade in 1096... The emperor had asked for a handful of mercenaries and got a massive army. Now the emperor needs a massive army, and the pope has only sent 200 men. Determined to press the Byzantines, Mehmed comes up with a new plan. Again, his force looks overwhelming on paper, but he has to keep all those men supplied, he has to keep them motivated, and whenever you have this kind of numbers of men in the field and trenches, you always run the risk of disease. The clock is ticking on him. There is only so long he can maintain this siege, and while it's only been a couple of weeks yet, he is still starting to get impatient and he is particularly sick of the fact that this Byzantine fleet is just sitting inside the Golden Horn, taunting him. He decides that if he can't go through their fleet, he's going to go around it. Over the next two days, his engineers would clear a path over land, north of the Golden Horn, and 
on the other side of a Genoese colony, the colony of Galata. Now, some historians, particularly Greek chroniclers of the time, have been critical of Galata for not putting up a fight against the Turks during the siege. All I would say in their defense is that without walls or an army, all that the few Genoese traders in this village can do is watch. And they watch as Mehmed orders trees cut down and greased heavily so that objects can be dragged over them. And then overnight between the 21st and the 22nd, he has many of his ships carried over this log bridge, dragged across these greased-up logs, overland and into the Golden Horn on the other side of the Byzantine fleet. And on the morning of the 22nd of April, Constantinople's defenders awaken to see Turkish ships in the harbor on the other side of their fleet. This doesn't just threaten their fleet or even their seawall. It also cuts them off from supplies from friendly Genoese on the other side of the horn. With this famous maneuver of bringing his ships over land, Mehmed's vice grip on the city of Constantinople tightens. But he has yet to break the defenses. Can Constantinople's defenders hold out until Venetian aid arrives? We'll find out and hear the rest of the story in the second half of 1453. Hello again, it's Dan, and I'm here to let you know about a few things we are doing to grow the show here at Relevant History. First off, there is now a monthly video series called Dan's War College. In that series, I, myself, do a video presentation on a particular battle from history and break down the tactics and the strategy involved. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, that is available at the Relevant History Patreon page, and that video, along with access to a private Discord server and, of course, a shout-out on the show, well, that can all be had for the low, low price of $5 a month. But if that's not enough, I'm also doing a monthly audio series called Irrelevant History, where we discuss silly or quirky events from history. That show, along with a couple of other shows from other people, well, those are all available on the Salad Tossers Patreon channel, and that is only $1 a month. And just like the Relevant History Patreon channel, you can find the link for that in the description. And of course, if you'd like to hear more episodes, they're available on every major podcast service, most of the minor ones, and at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Don't forget to share the show with your friends and leave reviews on your favorite service. Every little bit helps, and if you'd like to get in touch, you can find the show on Twitter at dantollerpodcast, that's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast, or on Facebook at dantoller, T-O-L-E-R. Finally, you can... Email me directly at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast at gmail.com. Hope to hear from you soon.